Okay. Hi, everyone. I am going to do like a quick video lecture. So this is what we'll do whenever I don't cover stuff or we have a lot of people gone for extra extracurricular stuff. And so in this case, <clears throat> we're going to do the RNA section that we did and we didn't get to finish. And then I'm also going to go into the genomics section that we're going to cover this week. But I'm kind of going to flip the classroom. We're not going to directly cover as much of that stuff with me just talking. We're going to kind of discuss some of the broader implications, especially as it relates to human ancestry and biology in class. So I'm joined at home today by Scout. So you probably won't hear her because she's resting, but she's right here. And if you've already seen this part and you felt pretty good about the RNA stuff, you can kind of, you know, skip the YouTube ahead a little bit or speed it up, whatever you want to do. If you were gone, this is this can supplement everything. Okay, so RNA is where we're going to start today. This is the transition molecule that DNA is going to be transcribed of, and then this is going to become information that will become proteins. Notice, obviously, the main key thing is that uracils are going to replace all your thymines, and this is going to give this a, kind of a semi-distinct structure. The uracils play a small role in that. But the key thing is that with a single strand, you have a lot more like integral 3D structure binding. You have the same stuff that you had before with, you know, nucleotides are fairly hydrophobic. This backbone is negative, remember. And so this is going to be interacting with all the water out here. These want to form a 3D structure in here of an interior that is less, you know, that it's more hydrophobic. So that 3D structure is going to form in a lot of cases. Okay, <clears throat> so we talked about the Stanley Miller hypothesis on the origin of life, which is essentially that under the conditions of the Earth as it was when it was still forming, there was a lot of heat, condensation, electricity, all kinds of stuff, and that this could form nucleotides and that these could form, and that eventually these nucleotides were able to start binding to each other and things like that. Amino acids were also around here. That's where you start getting polymers, and that's important. Can't always get an arrow to show up. There we go. This is when RNA is theorized or hypothesized to have formed into basically a 3D structure. And this is the idea that this was the first living molecule, to quote it. Now that's tough because we're still very much in the realm of chemistry. And we will not get to this last common ancestor of everybody, which is the cell, the initial cell, for quite a while. As you can tell, it still takes about, you know, 2 million years, or sorry, 200 million years. Okay, what happened is that there was a 3D RNA of some kind that had active sites made of nucleotides. Because remember, nucleotides have some, you know, capabilities. And so like on the outside right here, you probably had a bunch of, you know, nucleotides that could bind other nucleotides. And that's the idea is that eventually something happened that would bind nucleotides in a sequence and put them together, and that sequence was the same as this original sequence was. It started to replicate itself. And this is the beginning of the idea of RNA life, something that is going to self-replicate over and over and over again, and it's going to start making small changes in the nucleotide sequence. And remember, this is we're talking billions, hundreds of millions of years, this isn't something that's just going to happen overnight. You have some of these chance changes as these arrows are kind of going into right here. And eventually you get a chance change where you have this molecule that is going to replicate itself over and over. But eventually you get something, RNA structures, that are binding to the large RNA. But they also start binding to amino acids. And this is another key. The amino acids were running around the same way the nucleotides were but it's hypothesized that the RNA 3D structure grabbed amino acids and started putting them into a polymer. And then that this was the key to true reactions that could, you know, facilitate the last common ancestor of us all, the initial cell. Because now proteins come in and like we've said, they have massive amounts of function. There's 20 different amino acids. They can conform into massive 3D structures. Once you can coordinate proteins, proteins started to pop up. Tons of different varieties. You know, remember we talked about the polymers and how they can form these incredible 3D shapes that even today we can't create. But with time and chances, there came eventually a protein 
that could put RNA into a double-stranded helix form, DNA. DNA is much more stable. Nucleotides that are going to be in the helix, for example, they are never going to have to interact with water. So they are going to be a lot more, I can't draw the little thing. They are going to be a lot safer in the interior along here, as we're seeing right here. That meant that this information that was going to create these RNAs, that was going to translate that information into a protein, DNA is the storage molecule for this. And this was the key to sustained life. Because before, if you're just looking up here at the RNAs, these, although they can make copies of themselves, this is RNA, this is fleeting. It's very, very reactive. It's not gonna last forever. So once you had something that had DNA, could transition to RNA, that transition of protein. Eventually, there were also lipids in this environment. Eventually, a bilayer formed. It likely started as a single layer, and some DNA or RNA, you know, found their way inside a protective casing like this. And eventually, that was the birth of the first cell. And this had to happen one time. And that's a very cool and important thing in biology is when you have an event that, you know, we know that this happened one time because there are universal features of cells. There are not different kinds of cells, you know, at, at, uh, when, it, when it comes to the base, you know, eight to 10 characteristics, depending on what you're counting. So that's kind of the story of RNA and how it played a very, just a massive role in the origin of life, at least as we can best hypothesize it empirically. Okay. Now, DNA gets a lot of the press. It really does, and it is the blueprint molecule for everything, but RNA has a ton of power when it comes to what genes are on, off, everything. But for a long time, everybody just thought it existed as this transition state, it's nothing, it's this worth, worthless molecule. And like I said in lecture, that all changed when the French and the American groups found out together that this molecule, RNA, for this unknown virus that we're studying, this HIV, that it's an RNA genome. It doesn't have its own DNA. The RNA here has to go backwards and re-transcribe back into DNA. I don't know if I can spell it. Nice, all right, there we go. Nope, oh. And now I've screwed this up, okay. Okay, won't mess with that again. So this genetic material, this was the first time we found out that the genome of something could be RNA. And this, I don't know what that is. And this is what really revitalized the RNA field is like, wow, this molecule is powerful. So here's a good representation of the HIV genome. Here are three of its main genes. What you can tell about a genome like this is that although RNA doesn't always exist in a helix form, doesn't mean it can't. Doesn't mean these nucleotides are not interacting with each other, like I said, to form a 3D structure. These 3D structures are very much like the 3D structures that we saw DNA capable of forming. A lot of them have different shapes. A lot of them are going to attract different proteins. A lot of them are maybe going to inspire different cuts at certain areas. And especially with RNA, these nucleotides actually have a role to react with things, unlike DNA. These can actually chemically grab things, you know, move them through hydrogen bonds, things like that. Now, for HIV though, like this kind of goes over, um, you know, these are all going to be part of the genome and these are going to form ultimately proteins that are going to form more HIV, HIV virions. Okay. So yes, please do watch this video. It's really neat because this is going to show you how HIV is going to introduce RNA. That RNA has to turn into DNA. That DNA is going to get integrated into your genome. There are proteins that come with this virion package and here it is, there's integrase. This is gonna cut your DNA and it's gonna pop the new DNA that has been reverse transcribed into your genome. That's gonna start creating new proteins and you have an infection. All right, so we covered these. For a long time in HIV, we did not know why certain people could be exposed to the virus and not develop it. It turns out that our ancestors have been fighting retroviruses for a long time. Even our, you know, you know, really ancient ancestors. I'm not talking five to six million years ago. Let's talk in the hundreds of millions of years. Retroviruses have long been integrating into eukaryotic genomes. 
we have one massive defense against these, and these are a set of genes called Apobex. What Apobex are, are massive enzymes that cause mutations, okay? They find cytosines and they turn them into uracils, which is degraded by your cells, and it's gonna leave an abasic site. That's going to cause a mutation to one of these nucleotides, which is wrong. The role of these is to mutate things. We didn't know what their role was originally, but what we found out was that a lot of HIV patients that did well, they had apobex that would go in and they would mutate just the living stuff right out of the HIV virus. Now this only worked if these could get activated on time, because if they got activated and the body knew that a retrovirus was inside of it, it would start mutating everything that it could. Now this is a last ditch. As you can imagine, if you start mutating a bunch of stuff, you're gonna mutate stuff that is not meant to be mutated. And a lot of the times, you have a lot of people that develop cancers that also have HIV, not only because you're immune compromised, but because your innate immune defenses against the virus are going to hurt you as well. So these are a massive example of the power of enzymes when it comes to their variability in function and the defenses that we do have against something like HIV because we do have defenses. They don't always work and they are truly a last ditch. So those are very, these are very interesting genes and I'm, I hope that we can cover them a little more someday. This is the deanimation reaction that Apobec is going to facilitate. We are going to lose this group and that's how you turn a cytosine into a uracil. And once you do this, your body and your DNA is not going to know, it's going to know that uracil doesn't belong in your DNA, so it's going to completely eliminate this nucleotide, replace it with the wrong one, that's your mutation. We didn't get to this in lecture, so this is the edge of lecture. Okay, here's the problem, is that the HIV virus, why it is so infective, is that HIV has now produced its own protein called VIF. VIF is produced in the initial infection of HIV. It is in the HIV genome now. It goes and binds up to your apobec, and it targets it for that ubiquitination. Remember that? That's the, like the protein trash can. It finds your apobec, and it basically destroys it. This is a really elegant but terrifying example. Oh, I hate when it makes that shape of when viral evolution against your immune system gains the upper hand. Once this happens and once VIF is around to bind to Apobex, there you lose basically your best defense against this virus. And that's when things start going bad. Okay, so we've talked a lot about, you know, all these cool 3D RNA structures. There's one that you've seen a ton. This is the tRNA. So remember up here, oh, I can't draw over there. Here's your amino acid. I can't draw an A, I'm sorry. So up here is your amino acid. This is where that's gonna bind. I am just gonna get rid of all these things. Okay, here's where the amino acid binds up here. Okay, because remember if you watch the videos, and I would really suggest watching the videos if you're not 100% comfortable with translation, okay? Here's the amino acid that is gonna come in and start linking with the other amino acids. And here is your anticodon. Remember, because this is going to bind to the mRNA that's feeding through. It's going to bind one, two, three, and that's your codon. The tRNA is an amazing example of the functional 3D structure of an RNA. And it's super cool. See how this all forms up together. See how certain nucleotides are binding multiple times to each other. See how there are certain regions that are hooked in together certain ones that form a 3D helix and a shape. All of this is incredibly coordinated. If you ever lose this region, for example, yes, you lose the ability to meet up with your nucleotides and the, M the incoming mRNA, but even if you lose any of these regions, these regions, these regions, you can crater the entire 3D shape of this structure, very similar to how we talked about proteins being very sensitive to any changes in their 3D structure. This, so, so likely, this is the key 3D RNA that you would ever need to know. So, you can, have, you can make helices with this, you can form different loops, you can form hairpins, you can form all kinds of stuff, 
all of these have a role for binding, all of them have a role for attracting different partners, all kinds of different stuff. When it comes to RNA, like this says right here, assume that you can break rules with this molecule because you can. This is a single strand, it is going to react however it wants, however it's going to be favorable to conform. For example, because of all the different positions that RNA can find itself in, there is nothing stopping an A in the right, an ed, sorry, an adenine, an adenine, finding an adenine, and this all has to be at the right angle. Trust me, like this is not the same angle as, you know, what you see in DNA. You're in a 3D shape, you're moving in 3D ways. This is definitely a possible reaction. This is definitely a possible reaction. This is where you start breaking rules, is that in this 3D structure, there are a lot less rules because you're not in a nice ordered helix, okay? You can make things like this happen. So do take note of this. This is very important, and this is something I would obviously put on the test. Okay. There is one other functional, and I mean this as well, this is a very good example of another functional role of RNAs. That is the microRNA. Some RNAs, literally come from DNA and they are a gene, but they never become protein. What they do is that they form this 3D hairpin structure. There's an enzyme called Drosha that is going to export alongside Expo5 that is going to export this mRNA out. Dicer is going to come by and bind this hairpin loop. Now Dicer is an enzyme that is specifically, oops, <laughs> specifically Dicer is only gonna recognize this hairpin loop and this structure here and the nucleotides that are on top of it. Remember, Dicer has an active site just like everything else. That active site is going to find this structure. Oh, can't draw arrows. Okay, after that, you're going to end up with this dual-stranded mRNA. Half of it's going to go off, though, and you have the functional half. What that half and what this is going to do is find a target mRNA. It is going to bind to it right here at a certain complementary sequence that is going to attract a protein called RISC. RISC is going to cut this mRNA and prevent that gene from making it to translation. Now it might cut it, it might just decay it. But what mRNA do is they block this interaction. They block certain other RNAs. They target other RNAs and they eliminate them or block them, as I said. This is a very, very good example of how to regulate at the RNA level. Note that for the test for that big question on how you, um, you know, regulate it, DNA level, RNA level, and protein level. Okay, here's a couple other fun features of RNA. As you can tell here in this 3D structure, and remember, you have a massive OH. Remember how that's the big key difference between RNA and DNA? You have that extra reactive OH group. This means this can bind all over the place. That makes it more reactive and more susceptible to degradation but it also means that it can form a very diverse array of shapes. So this is, a, this is another good function to note. It's in blue, obviously, so I don't need you to really know this, like, you know, strictly, strictly. But a lot of RNA 3D structures can be held together by ions because they're going to interact with the nucleotides. And sometimes only in the presence of certain ions are they going to activate or deactivate, for example. And this gives them a ton of flexibility. And we call these genes, again, RNAs that aren't going to form proteins, we call these riboswitches. And they're only going to elicit their 3D function if the ion is present. So this is a very good example of something that is environmentally stimulated to start acting on the epigenome and start regulating genes. So it's very good. Okay. So that finishes out RNA. Um, we talked a little bit about this. We've already kind of covered these three slides about how DNA is going to denature at this level. This is why we PCR, for example, at this heat, because we need to add our primers here and here, but we can't add primers if they're, you know, all scrubbed together like that. So at this heat, yep, you can see like these nice little spots where DNA is going to unanneal. And we've kind of covered this idea before. I probably didn't need to include this. Hybrid region. So if you have a sample from species number two, sample from species number one, you can see if duplexes form. Oh, look, you know, this region right here, we can sequence. That's a region that's conserved between two species. So that's how we used to have to do things when it came to deciding what species were closely related to each other. Now, luckily, we can just sequence a lot of stuff and go from there. Okay. So, 
we are on to the next chapter. You can kind of take a little break here if you want, but I'm just going to keep talking. Um, you know, I tend to do that. This is genomics. What genomics is going to go over and what the broad meaning is, is that this is the study of collective amounts of DNA, collective amounts of RNA, and to a degree, collective amounts of protein. But as you'll find, protein is very difficult to study in mass. It is so difficult to study in mass. There are not reliable ways to do it. You have to target what protein you're measuring instead. Now, some of the biochemistry faculty may disagree, but we have many more tools to measure large quantities of DNA, large quantities of RNA, and then make conclusions about protein. So these two gentlemen, Francis Collins, right here smiling, and then much scarier, Dr. Venter. These two are the two that led the coalition that sequence the human genome. Venter, so down here at the bottom, he worked for Solera, who had a methodology called shotgun sequencing. This is a private company. Francis Collins was leading the effort on behalf of the National Institutes of Health. They were using Sanger sequencing. So the difference is, with Sanger sequencing, you get a very accurate read of about 300 or 400 base pairs along a string of nucleotides. The genome is 4.7 billion nucleotides long, and here they were just going 300 at a time. And I mean, you had multiple people doing stuff, but still, that was, that was tough. Now what Venter had was something called shotgun sequencing. And we'll, I think we'll cover this a little bit down here, but I'll draw it in class. Essentially, you break up the genome into tiny segments, and a computer is going to see how they put those segments back together, and you can accomplish really big regions like that. Problem is, is that in regions of lots of repeats or patterns, shotgun sequencing was terrible because the computer could not tell when the sequence ended and when it didn't. That's why they used Sanger sequencing for the regions that were indeterminate, and they used shotgun sequencing for the regions that were really large and long, but also but very unique too. So this figure is something that I did. This is basically the collective genomes of this many, so like, I don't know, thousands, of different lymphoma genomes for regions at which the DNA copy number, which is like how many, you know, duplications or deletions there are exist in certain regions of the genome. And as you can tell, there's chromosome one, two, three, four, five, six on, and I've labeled some of the genes. In red are areas where there's, there's too many copies of that region per, for that disease. Blue is regions where that region has been deleted in the chromosome. Okay. Other big reason that we use genomics, not only for the human genome and to study diseases associated with genes, but we need to sequence all the genetic material. In this case, Ebola right here. This is the Ebola virus. It is one of the thicker, nastier viruses out there. It is surrounded by a massive protein coat. We also, not only for disease, but also it's good to study the E. coli um, genome because we use this as a tool in biomedicine all the time, but it is also very good to know, you know, exactly where certain genes are in E. coli. Okay. This is what we're going to cover a little bit in class. So I'll, you can pause it here and take a look at some of these details. But Homo sapiens, which is what we are, we were not always the only bipedal hominid species. There were two specifically that existed around the same time as us, the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. Their genome, although similar, you can tell that there are certain specific differences noted in blue for Denisovans and red for Neanderthals. Some of these regions were incorporated into our genome, and that was confirmed only, you know, 10 years ago, and that, that confirmed a lot of stuff, and it also, you know, brought up a lot of interdisciplinary you know, philosophical ideas of like, oh my goodness, parts of our genome are from Neanderthals. Parts of our genomes are from Denisovans. These are going to be pretty geographic specific, and we're going to cover this on Monday or Wednesday. But this is where the importance of this lies, I'd, I'd say. This is a very good figure of, you know, this is literally what the sequences are that we can call, you know, and this is where we get the idea that only some regions are exon coding genes, and it is very small. A lot of the others are, look at all these jumping elements. These are jumping elements. These are jumping elements. And then you have all these structural and miscellaneous sequences. Now, for all these, so for the protein coding genes, 
what are they actually making, right? In this case, a lot of them are enzymes, some of them are cytoskeleton, immune, all kinds of stuff. Oops. Lots of transcription factors too. And this shows, so remember, transcription factors are what are responsible for turning on different genes. Look how many, you know, 7% doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a lot of transcription factors for all the genes that you have. That means there's a ton of combinations of what's turning on and off. Okay, another huge reason to study genomics is that we don't want to test everything on humans. We want to test it on the mouse, okay? So that means that we can find certain regions that are still conserved across mice and humans, for example, and we can study the mouse gene instead of having to study the human gene in humans. Perfect. You'll also know, and if any of you get directly more into science, mouse genes, which are the most common model organism for healthcare, they're going to be lowercase. So note that when you're writing papers or things like that. All human genes, oh God, not again. Um, all human genes are uppercase. All right, so we covered this, and I feel as though I should cover this more. Um, remember that when you have an mRNA, you are going to translate, or you're going to transcribe all the introns in that region too. You're not just going to just get the exons, okay? So you want the exons to translate into protein. So you do need to cut out all the introns, and you're going to make a nice mRNA that's only made of exons, for example. Now, the flexibility here and why you can have this single gene could become multiple different proteins is that you can decide to, you know, skip exon one, take exon two, take exon, take exon three, skip exon four, and take exon five. So you could make a sample, you could make all kinds of different combinations of exons that you want, and that's called alternative splicing. Sometimes you can take out little pieces, and this is what Marshall's paper was talking about, is that at his region in that PML gene, this intron was interfering and it had too many repeats, and that PML exon 5 started to come off, and the entire splicing for the whole thing actually started to, you know, kind of fall apart. So this is something that we'll get to cover a lot more once we get into strict transcript, uh, transcriptomics. Sorry. But do remember that a single region of the DNA is going to make an mRNA, but that mRNA has a lot of diversity about what it can become. Okay. Here's some of the meat behind genomics. This is when you start getting the idea of metagenomics. You want to see regions that differ and you want to find a consensus. So right here, see all these four right here, these are consensus. Most, if not all humans have a lot of regions that are completely alike. It is SNPs though, like we've covered, that sometimes have a small difference. Some people have certain SNPs in certain regions while others don't. And we have millions of these SNPs in our genomes that we can track, find, and once you find them, by collectively assessing everybody's big genome, you can start to say, do you have this region or do you have this region, for example? And this is how you start assigning differences in the human genome between two people. Now, this is humans. Let's back up a few million years. This is tracking changes in a key protein receptor for progesterone. In humans, we all started, so there's a last common ancestor right here at this point, about six million years ago, before any of these three ever existed, there existed one species here instead. In that time, we can measure all the changes that our progesterone receptor has made because all these changes are unique to humans. Anything that's unique to both of these species is right here for these changes. Anything that is unique, amino, remember these are amino acid changes, not uh, DNA, so they are DNA changes that change amino acids. These are unique to chimps, these are unique to bonobos. By mapping the changes in key proteins, this is a very good way to say, here's where we genetically diverged. We made these changes they made all of these, for example. This is where you start being able to speciate and define difference between very, very similar species when it comes to the DNA. And again, you can go right into the DNA itself. We have a last common ancestor between these three. 
that existed, I think, between now that orangutans are in this, maybe 10 to 20 million years ago. So remember, at that point, none of these three existed 20 million years ago with this thing, okay? So the outgroup is something that this is kind of your control. This is something distantly related that should represent this, you know, this, this change or this species. So here, that means that you can highlight that chimps at this region have a guanine, we have a thymine. And that somewhere in this area, this changed into a thymine because it used to be a G. Because our outgroup says so too. And we can see that chimps had never had a change in this region. Now, there, are only, there is only so much that we can learn from small DNA events like that that change proteins or change nucleotides. It is much more common, and this is where our DNA diverges by almost 30% with chimps and bonobos, and we'll point that out on tomorrow that bonobos likely represent a better representation of us than chimps. Oftentimes you can just straight up lose an entire region of the chromosome. D is gone in here, okay? You can duplicate regions. Now you got multiple versions of the same gene and maybe this all becomes some kind of super gene, who knows? Inverting genes usually is going to destroy them. See how this is the wrong order? This now reads that way and it should be reading this way. Sometimes this can create a new gene. Oftentimes it's going to just mess everything up. Translocation, this is when you go to an entirely new chromosome by accident. Now, this can change how much this gene is on, for example, because this chromosome may be firing at like a very high rate. It may be next to new genes. And one last thing that a translocation can do, and this is an important difference between humans and our ancestors, sometimes chromosomes fuse. They become one chromosome. Sometimes only small parts of, of these reciprocal translocations are going to form new fusions. But other times, massive events like this have happened and this is a key difference between our two species, is that chimps have two chromosomes for chromosome two, where we have one. So this fusion in here, is likely very, very large differences between the species that can be elicited from these regions. There's no direct answers to that, but you have to imagine with such a divergent change, something exists in there. Okay, now on to a technique that personally, and I would ask you to make your own conclusions on this, technique that I find to be almost better at saying, you know, what, is the, what are the genetic drivers, what's happening right now? And that's RNA-seq. This is where, and I consider doing this in lab for us, but RNA is kind of hard to work with. This is where you take RNA, you steal a reverse transcriptase from HIV. Remember how HIV turns mRNA into DNA? You put that enzyme in and you turn mRNA that you extract from cells or tissue into cDNA. Perfect, because cDNA is way more stable and we can actually work with this. So now we have basically an RNA copy, but now it's in DNA, so that's good. All you do here is you make a little library and I, so I do want you to go view those videos on next generation sequencing and how that works, because then we're, we'll, we'll cover that a little bit Monday, Wednesday. But what you get is regions and reads of areas in the genome that are actively transcribing into RNA. So this is perfect. RNA-seq is the best technique for saying, this gene is on a ton right here, you know, or this region right here is off. This region is not on very high, but this region is huge. So this gene right here is firing off a ton, for example. This is very, very, very good when it comes to looking at data for, let's say, disease. If you have somebody, and I hate to keep using coronavirus, if you have patients that don't have coronavirus and you have 100 patients that do have coronavirus and you compare 100 versus 100, you can say, what are the regions that are actively transcribing in those with coronavirus that are not active in those without? Those regions are most likely the reaction to the virus, right? Now you can apply that experimental technique to a lot of public data. And this is where we're starting to find tons of new ideas and stuff, especially in cancer, is because we're seeing what's active and what's not. Okay, alu elements. This is our jumping gene. We've talked about the retrotransposons, okay? Our jumping gene is very good at knocking out genes 
sometimes it causes a new exon to show up because this alu element can get translated sometimes. It can ruin certain you know, splicing sites. It can make new promoters, for example, all kinds of stuff. So when we look at Ancestry this week, it's going a lot of our differences between our last common ancestors are because our genome is full of these elements. The chimp and the bonobo genome are not dominated by these elements the same way ours is. These elements are what we theorize led to basically the quick, the like, you know, the very rapid evolution of our species. Now, there's a lot that goes into that. Cool, so something that followed our evolution. Viruses. Viruses have constantly been evolving to always be able to hook into whatever cell we have. Remember that viruses are usually very specific. For example, HIV is only going to affect humans. SIV is only going to affect chimps. In this case, this pig retrovirus is only going to find certain receptors on the pig host cell and bind to them. So these, these two photos also show two different entry method, methods. Receptor-mediated endocytosis means that this virus needs a protein receptor on here that it's going to target. And those are all going to coalesce when they get bound by the virus. The virus is going to be invited in, and it's going to start going to infect. Fusion is different. Fusion means that the virus can just find the plasma membrane, and it's just going to fuse up with it. Okay, No entry ticket required, the same way you need a specific receptor for this one to show up. This is why certain diseases are much more capable of infecting almost all your cells and a wider variety of species, is that they are just going to form up with the plasma membrane immediately. Okay, this is a good one. We're almost done. Don't worry. Viruses come in many, many different shapes and sizes. This is a very good test question material slide, I have to be honest. There are di very different ways to get to RNA that ultimately you need to get to proteins because you need to make more viruses eventually, and viruses are made of proteins that shield their DNA, or their RNA, as you can tell. So, again, on the debate of whether viruses are alive, it's tough, because they are going to have all kinds of different genetic material they infect you with. For example, let's start easy with group one. They just have DNA just like yours. They show up, they translate it using your machinery into RNA, and they go to proteins. Easy enough. Single-stranded DNA. This is very, very important. This is very unique. You have a single strand of DNA here. When you get the infection happens, your machinery turns it into double strand for, its, for itself, and you go from there. Group three is RNA, but it's double-stranded RNA. This can quickly, as you can tell, there's no step in here, this can quickly just unwind, and that RNA is going to make proteins. Good. Okay. This starts to get a little more complicated. RNA positive sense means that it's going to have to basically invert its sequence and recopy itself in the right direction for your cells to read, and then it's going to become RNA. Group 5, very easy again. It just carries a straight-up RNA genome that is ready to go. No changes necessary, nothing. Okay, this is your HIV. Well, no, this is not your HIV, because this is not integrating into the genome. What group 6 does is that it shows up with RNA, it does reverse transcribe, and that DNA just kind of floats in and is made into RNA. Oops. It does not actually integrate into the genome the way that group 7 does. Group 7 is going to... Wait a sec. Nope, give me a sec. One, two, three. Yep, never mind. No, no, no. Group 6 is HIV. This is going to directly integrate into your genome, and that's how it's going to start to become RNA. Sorry. So this virus right here starts as DNA. It becomes RNA. It integrates back into DNA. It integrates back into the genome. Ugh. Okay. It gets complicated, as you can tell. I will, um, I may, I'll probably elaborate more on this slide in, uh, in class. But there is a diverse way of, you know, methodologies for RNA to get into your cells and start making proteins. All right, we are all done. This is the last slide. It's just a, oh no, I can't like get up any farther. Um, it's just a good, down here, it's just integrated. Um, it's just a good slide of what reverse transcription looks like and how it just basically is going to take 
the cDNA that it made from RNA, it's gonna cut with integrase right here, and it's gonna integrate. Okay, that's a big, long lecture. Um, this is better than us having four days of lecture like this class has had in the past and or many other advanced classes, so occasionally we're not gonna hit everything that we need for lecture. Um, so hopefully this is helpful. If, if you have questions that still email me, treat this like a normal lecture and uh, we should be good.